Okay, so hopefully Ellen's given you a flavour of what's available and all the sort of things that, you know, potentially you could do with the data. Now, I know some of you who are here this afternoon have already gone through the application process and have projects up and running already. So it's really good to see you all here this afternoon. But some of them, some of you won't have gone through that process. So this will potentially be all new to you. So I thought it would be useful just to talk through the application process. So what you need to do if you want to, to work with these data. And before I get started about talking about the, the practicalities of applying for these data, I, I want to just situate it in the context of data access policy, because I think it's important to have a little bit of an understanding of this before you access these data. So essentially, data access exists on a spectrum. And you've got open data where, you know, the, de the data is, is not that detailed, it might be aggregate data, and there is no considered risk that any participants in that data could be re-identified. And generally there won't be any restrictions on the reuse of these data. Then you have this middle section of the spectrum, which is safeguarded data, and this is where there might be potentially a risk of re-identification, but it is very, very low or even zero. And this is data that's available under our end user license or perhaps our special license. So there's a little bit of paperwork to do. So you need to have authentication and authorization. And you might already be very familiar with that process if you've worked with data through the UK data service before. But the third group, which is what we're going to talk about for the rest of this webinar, is the controlled data access. Now, this is where the data is very much more detailed. There is a risk of re-identification within it. So we require, again, the authentication and the authorization, but there are additional steps to go through. And that requires approval of project, the vetting and training of researchers, for example. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more detail. But I just wanted to, to set that context before we get going. So accessing control data involves a secure access agreement. Now, I'm not going to talk about the legislation in detail because I'm, I'm not a a lawyer at all, but I, and I don't think you need to know the legislation in huge detail, but I think it's important to realise that these controlled data, these secure data, are only made available for access through specific legislative acts. And this legislation allows us to provide access to personally identified data, identifiable data under a legal gateway. Now those legal gateways vary, there will be different legislative acts depending on the, the data source, but essentially they all do the same thing. They determine who can access what data, for what purpose, under what conditions and for how long. And I think that's really the take home message here that I want you to have. So under these legal gateways, researchers access data and they undertake their analyses in a safe setting. And sometimes you might hear those called safe havens, um, secure labs, all there's different terms, but essentially it's a, a secure setting. And researchers agree to conditions for handling personal data. They agree to breach penalties. They agree to be trained and to become an accredited researcher. And I'm going to explain that in more detail. And they agree that their research projects will be accredited as well. And there is the need for the institution to countersign on behalf of the researcher as well. 
So that's kind of a, a really, really top level explanation just to set, set the scene. But I'm gonna move on and I'm gonna talk about the application process in detail now. So the application process is a multi-stage process. You need to be allowing time for this process. So, you know, it's not an overnight job. You need to really allow a couple of months. Researchers have got to be based in the UK whilst they're accessing these data. So just bear in mind that if you are based in, in multiple locations, access to secure data has to be done whilst you're based in the UK. You need to apply to become an accredited researcher, which means you have to meet the data owner's criteria and you have to attend a short training course. And again, I'll explain a, a little more about that in a second. And the next stage is to submit a research proposal. And your research has got to have a valid statistical purpose and it has to be feasible. And again, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. But first, I want to explain what we mean by accredited researcher. Now, this isn't actually a very complex process. You need to submit an application form. And you will then need to complete the safe researcher training course. So it's it's not a particularly complicated process, but you do have to spend a little bit of time completing that form fully. That's probably my number one tip. And you will need to meet the accreditation criteria. Now, just to give you a little background on the accredited researcher status. Now, the Office for National Statistics, the ONS, have been given the authority to manage this accreditation process. Now, this is something that you only need to do once every five years. So it's not something that you have to do every project or every year. It's just you do it, your status lasts for five years. At the end of that five years, you'll need to refresh that status. The good thing about having the AR status is that you can use it across all accredited Digital Economy Act processes. Now, we at the UK Data Service are one such processor. There are others, for example, the ONS and the HMRC. So if six months, a year down the line, you decide you want to go off and do some research with the HMRC, you don't have to reapply for the AR status. Okay. Just one other little thing to know, as an AR, you will need to agree to your name being added to the UK Statistics Authority website. They are keeping a list of all AR researchers. Now, I mentioned that you have to meet the AR criteria, and this is really what it is. So the first two bits are ensuring that you have the expertise and the experience to actually do the analysis and work with these data. So they ask for um, information about whether you have a, an undergraduate degree or higher, which includes a significant proportion of maths or, or statistics, or alternatively, you can demonstrate at least three years quantitative research experience. Then the other parts of the criteria is that you have to complete the safe research training course, agree, as I say, to your inclusion on the list of AR researchers. There is the criteria that you need to agree to publish the results um, completed through this scheme, and you have to sign and adhere to a formal accredited research declaration. So that's kind of it. Now, the safe researcher training is designed around the basis that using sensitive control data is pretty much all about common sense. So if you've got a bit of common sense, you're going to be absolutely fine. However, there are some bits of specific knowledge that you will need around disclosure risk and how to mitigate it. 
and a lot of researchers unless they've had this experience of working with controlled data will not have that specific knowledge so that's why we train you it's a short course at the moment, thanks to COVID, it's online. And it lasts about three, three and a half hours. And that kind of depends on the group, really. If we, if we have a larger group and we get a lot more questions, it will last a little bit longer. The course itself will introduce you to the wider context. So looking at um, understanding data access, looking at the five safe framework, which you may or may not be familiar with, how things might go wrong with data access. And we talk about this concept of safe people. And then we'll introduce the technical knowledge. And this is all around statistical disclosure control, which is the process of ensuring that survey participants are not identifiable in the publication of research outputs. Attendees need to take and pass an online test afterwards. Now the good news is we have an extremely high pass rate so it's not anything to really get too concerned about but you do need to pass this test. Okay so that's all about you as a researcher and then the, the second stage of the process is to have your research project accredited. Now, as Ellen mentioned, all project applications have to be approved by the Data Governance Board. And I'm going to introduce you to the board and what they do in just a second. I'm going to cover some top tips about completing project applications, but I will say this off the bat. They have to be thoroughly completed. And I'm going to dig into that a little bit more. Um, in just a few minutes. In particular, you will need to pay close attention to how you're meeting the public good and also providing evidence of ethical approval. Now, you should all be doing this at your institution level anyway, so this should be familiar territory, but I am going to just cover ethics a little bit more right at the end. Now, CERN has its own data governance board, and they are a group of highly experienced um, researchers and data professionals with a vast amount of expertise. And it is their job to review and approve applications. And their aim is to do that through transparency and fairness. Now, data governance boards Sometimes they're also referred to as data access committees, but they tend to follow a very similar design. So they'll have a panel membership that will have experienced researchers, stakeholders, they'll have a secretariat. Some will have lay members, some won't, but they will all meet periodically and it's most commonly monthly. Now, some of the data access committees that I sit on have been going for many years, and some of them will have a system of precedence for common project types. So some will have a system where projects may not need to go to a full board review, but that tends to be only committees and boards that have been going for a considerable period of time. <clears throat> and their job essentially is to consider this. Is what you're proposing an appropriate use of the data? Is it legal? Is it ethical? Is it feasible? And that's kind of it. <clears throat> now you will have to provide a set of materials for the panel, which as a minimum will consist of your project application and your ethics assessments. It may be that there are other supporting materials that are appropriate, but that's not in every case. The outcomes that are possible from a review by the Data Governance Board is full approval, 
it might be that they give you a conditional approval, but they will come back and ask for a little bit more information or clarification or some amendments. They do also have the option to reject applications. <clears throat> That's not a very common option. The majority will go through either with full approval or conditional approval. Now the UK data service, we have a role in this process and our role is to triage all of your applications before they go to the data governance board. And our role, our aim is to make sure that every single application that goes to the board is of the highest possible quality so that they all get through with full approval at first review. That's kind of our aim. So when you're applying, you will deal with, with us at the UKDS and we will guide you through the application process. We'll give you any guidance on whether you can improve your application, whether there's anything missing. So, you know, we'll work with you throughout that process. So my top tips for a successful project application, which is approved at first review. And I, I alluded to this earlier, but my number one tip above all else is detail, detail, detail. I see a lot of applications where researchers miss sections of the form. And unfortunately, we can't submit incomplete project applications to the board. They would be rather annoyed with us if we did that. It's important to realise that your the board will very, very closely scrutinise what you plan to do because they have to make a, an informed decision. So make sure everything is completed. If there's something that's not applicable to you, make a note of that. That's absolutely fine. But don't go leaving chunks of the form blank. The second and third tip really go hand in hand. And this again is about detail and about clarity. Please make sure that you have outlined a clear research proposal, whether that's having a set of specific research questions or a very clearly defined aim. The more detail, the better is, is the is the watchword here. The same goes for the methodology. You will be asked to to outline your methodology. Now, you may not have worked out all the details, but you should at least have a plan of how you're going to get started. And both of these need to apply the first tip: detail, detail, detail. The next tip is to make sure you've included details of all of the data you need. A common error, I think, is for somebody just to put something very broad, like cell data. You need to be more specific. So if it's data from the UKDS catalogue, put the study number. So that will be SN and four digits. The clearer you are here, the easier it is for us to process your application. Let's talk about public good. Now this is absolutely fundamental um, and it's something that the, the board will pay close attention to. My top tip here is don't overpromise. We are not expecting you to solve the world's problems, so don't promise that you're going to do that it's more likely that what you're going to be doing is adding to the existing evidence base or extending our understanding of a particular issue. And they are absolutely perfectly valid. You know, we've, we see the odd application form where somebody might put, I'm going to solve this issue. And, and the board tend to be a little bit unsure about whether that's really feasible for a research project. So be realistic and don't overpromise. The other thing is allow enough time. And I mean this in two ways. The first is 
don't try and fill out the application form in five minutes. Again, you know, don't spend day in, day out, but make sure you spend a little bit of time doing it well the first time. The other thing is you are asked to say when you think the project is going to finish. And it's a common um, it's a common habit to be a little bit over optimistic about how long you think your project will take. Always allow a little bit longer than you think because life happens and you know deadlines get pushed back. My final top tip again is take time over your ethics form and I'm going to talk about ethics now. And ethics forms can be surprisingly tricky I think. Now you will be used to doing institutional ethics forms and that is part of the application process so we need to see evidence that you have gained institutional approval. We also need to see a UK Statistics Authority ethics self-assessment form. Now the UK Stats Authority are really pushing forward with their ethics agenda now and they've developed a fantastic self-assessment tool and their hope is that they have designed an easy to use framework which enables you as researchers to review the ethics of your project for yourself. There are six main principles and we can see public good, training, legal gateways, all of the sort of things we've talked about this afternoon. They're all part of this ethics assessment. Each of these six principles are broken down into a number of items and there are 22 in total. If you haven't had to complete one of these before, it is essentially an Excel spreadsheet, which looks a little bit like this screenshot you can see on the screen. And essentially what you have to do is for each of the 22 items, you have to give your project a score and then you have to provide a justification for why you've given it that score and the spreadsheet will automatically calculate an over, overall score and the data governance board will pay close attention to this. I have to say that some of the items are more self-explanatory than others. Others are a little less clear, I think, and they tend to catch researchers on the back foot. So the first one we can see on the screen is public benefit, and I think most people will find that fairly self-explanatory. But some of the others, like potential harm, can catch people off guard. So my top tips here is read the guidance given by the UK Stats Authority and I've put the link to that at the bottom of this slide. So when you make, when you access the slides after the event, you can just click on that link and go to the um, guidance. If you are unfamiliar with this framework, I would recommend you have a scan through the guidance first. The reason being is it will explain each of the items and it will also give you suggestions of the sort of things that you can write for your justification. And I can't stress that enough. And I think once you've done one or two of these, they become, you know, quite a straightforward process, but they can be a bit tricky first off. I think the common errors that I see with these are that people are not really understanding what the item is getting at. So their justification doesn't quite address the right issue. You will need to demonstrate careful consideration of each item. You don't have to write an essay for each one. You know, a sentence can be more than sufficient, but you have to demonstrate this careful consideration. The other thing I want to mention, which I think is, is unique to the cell project to a degree, is that we have researchers who work on the cell project with the data collection, as well as working on the analysis of the data. 
and it's a common thing that, that researchers, when they're completing the ethics form, will conflate the two and they'll answer the, the items on the ethics form about the data collection and they shouldn't. It's just focusing on the analysis of the data. So that's really all I want to cover this afternoon. Hopefully that will break down the process um, and, and take some of the mystery out of it and help you to put together an application which whizzes through review on the first, first go.